everyone, and welcome to another installment of the Origo webinar series. Uh, my name is Corey Norton. I'm part of the sales leadership team here at Origo, and I have the pleasure of kicking off today's webinar where we'll be discussing resilience and water infrastructure for a sustainable future. Our panelists will be discussing topics including the current state of water in the United States, uh, building resilience into water infrastructure, the funding and policy frameworks that go into that process, and the role that technology plays in getting that done. Now, before we get to that discussion, I do have a few quick notes. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and we will provide all registered participants with the recording as well as the slides that we go over today. Uh, we ask that you please submit any questions throughout the webinar via the Q&A chat box, and we will address them during the Q&A with the panelists at the end of the discussion. If we can't get to all the questions during the available time, We'll, we will make sure to follow up with you in order to get those questions answered for you. Uh, I'd now like to introduce our panelists for the afternoon, uh, starting with Dr. Jeff Yang. Dr. Yang is a senior scientist and acting branch chief with the US EPA Water Infrastructure Division in Cincinnati. Uh, he has a PhD in environmental engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. He has published extensively on EPA's priority R&D programs, including climate change and urban infrastructure, uh, his research has been featured in top academic journals such as Nature, Climate Change, and Science. He's also involved in developing ORD's strategic research plans, leading international R&D cooperations, and participating in intergovernmental panels on climate change. He's a licensed professional engineer and has received numerous awards for his work, including the EPA's Gold Medal for Excellence in Research and Development. We're also joined by Andrea uh, suarez Abastido, who is the director of NMB Water, the public water and sewer utility in the city of North Miami Beach. Uh, she's a licensed professional engineer with over 10 years of experience in the water industry. Uh, she has a master of science in environmental engineering from Florida International University. Uh, and prior to joining NMB Water, Andrea worked as a project manager for the Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department. In this role, she was responsible for managing a $2 billion consent decree program to improve the water and sewer infrastructure in Miami-Dade County. Uh, Andrea is a strong advocate for water conservation and affordability, and she's also a member of the American Water Works Association and the Water Environment uh, Federation. And as always, we're joined by our senior marketing manager here at Oregon, Stephanie Pedroza, who will be leading today's discussion. So thank you, panelists. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for this discussion. And Stephanie, I will pass it over to you to get things started. Awesome. Thank you, Corey, and good afternoon to everyone from my end. And I want to thank our panelists for sharing your insights and shedding light on this important topic that I'm looking forward to discussing. We can all agree water infrastructure resiliency plays a pivotal role in ensuring that our communities obtain safe and clean water for their everyday lives. And we all know that water is an essential substance to keep all of us running, going, and living. But we must also acknowledge the challenges that come with the complex nature of our water systems and the ever-increasing uncertainties at times, such as climate change, population increase, um, just all the uncertainties that are coming our way that continue to strain our nation's infrastructure. So there's definitely a great deal to unpack. But before we get started, we're going to launch a quick poll just to get to know who's in our audience. So if you can please go ahead and tick, or just answer what best fits your organization. Are you with roads and bridges, water, wastewater, transit and rail, broadband, other. So take a couple of seconds to answer the poll above. And it looks like no one has, okay, we got about three people that just submitted. <laughs> I always like looking at the percentage just to see how many people have submitted. So I'm going to give it a couple more seconds if you don't mind taking time to answer the poll. All right. It's about 48. Okay, now that's 60%. So I'm going to go ahead and see. So we have a lot of water, wastewater, which is probably expected, roads and bridges, rail and transit, and other. And now the next poll question which of the following best describes your role? Are you a project manager? Are you in capital planning and finance, an engineer, consultant, admin, or other? So take a couple of seconds to answer that poll. All 
All right. I feel like we need some music while the poll questions go through so there's not a lot of silence. <laughs> All right, give it a couple more seconds. Okay. So a lot of project managers, engineers, several admin. Awesome. Well, thanks for taking the time to answer that. And we'll move on to our discussion. And it's no secret that our water infrastructure needs major sustainable improvements. And as you can see, much of our nation's infrastructure was built in the 70s and much of it is underground, which is causing a lot of challenges when it comes to safe water delivery. And I'm gonna open the discussion with you, Andrea. Tell us a little bit about the infrastructure programs that are being managed at North Miami and what are some challenges that you've seen in North Miami with water delivery? Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you for having me. And it's a, a pleasure to be here to talk about uh, the city of North Miami Beach water utility. We are the second largest utility in Miami-Dade County after Miami-Dade water and sewer. We serve the Northeast portion of the county. And even though we are, we belong to the city of North Miami Beach, we actually provide uh, water and uh, to other cities like Miami Gardens, um, Golden Beach, Aventura, portions of an unincorporated Miami-Dade, and uh, Sunny Isles. So, so we serve about 180,000 customers, and we also provide wastewater collection. So what we have is approximately 600 miles of distribution and transmission lines. And we also have about 117 miles of, of wastewater collection. So as you mentioned, one of the important things to, to think about is everything is underground. Most of the times people don't think too much about it until you cannot uh, flush a toilet or you don't have water. Or uh, sometimes people don't think firefighting ability is also something that we do provide. So it's a... Uh, uh, a uh, health and safety item. So what we do is we organize in, in a master plan. We look at the projects, we see our infrastructure and that becomes part of the maintenance. So what items require to be upgraded? We have the water treatment plan. Right now it's a 41 MGD water treatment plan with three treatment systems. We have nanofiltration, RO, and we have lime softening, all three in one plant. We do not treat wastewater. We send the wastewater to the county for treatment. So what we need to think about is the age of the infrastructure and try to address some of the um, issues that we might have with some of the aging infrastructure ahead of time. So we do have a five-year capital improvement project that it's ongoing right now that addresses system-wide um, or changes in some of the pipelines, uh, flow meters, which is important for us as well, increase for fire flow, which so what we do is we increase the pipe that we have. A lot of the old piping was two inch, four inch. So we're increasing to uh, six inch, eight inch, 10 inch to be able to add some additional fire hydrants through the system. At the plan right now, we have a 34 million um, design build project where we're upgrading the uh, it's a, the lime softening system is from the 40s. It's been expanded, but it never has been rehabilitated. So right now we're going through that process of doing that. So we need to see the demands, what we are looking to the future. So we do have a planning horizon. And we look at what projects need to be addressed, obviously, uh, based on the funding that you have. So you usually plan for five years, looking at 20 years ahead of time. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thanks. And Jeff, can you give us a high level overview of how EPA works with water agencies for infrastructure and safe water delivery? Okay, um, thanks for this opportunity and uh, I will give a try my best. Uh, and uh, quite interesting, um, I mean, the uh, conference right now is uh, the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers, EWRI, the uh, uh, Environment and the Water um, uh, 
uh, Institute. Um, so is is there is a lot of talks about the, the issues that you just um, ask. Uh, uh, regarding the EPA, how the EPA works with uh, what agencies, with what utilities and uh, the stakeholders. Um, EPA, as you all know, is uh, uh, just in the, in the very large broader view. EPA is separated into two parts. One is what is called the program offices. That's the parts like uh, Office of Water, Office of Air and Radiation, and uh, um, Office of Land and uh, Environment Management. So these are the offices uh, uh, managing and, uh, uh, and uh, execute um, the environmental laws, such as Clean Water Act and Safe Drink Water Act, and also the, uh, the laws regarding Superfund uh, laws and uh, the others. And the other part of EPA is called the Office for Research and Development, that's the research arm of the agency provide a technical and scientific basis for the regulations as well as to support uh, the stakeholders, such as all the water agencies and the water utilities. That's the part of the agency I belong to. And uh, within the ORD, that's Office of Research and Development, we have um, we have uh, uh, different centers, uh, largely on the risk assessment and also on the risk management. And the risk management, uh, and that is uh, at the center, that's only one center, and that's called the Center of Environment Solutions and the Emergency Response. That's people call, at the EPA, at the agency, we always use acronyms, that's called CESAR. And the CESAR has uh, four, different divisions, uh, and I'm in the water infrastructure division, represents uh, doing all the research uh, work and development work and technical support to the stakeholders on anything about the water programs and the water infrastructure. And right now I'm the acting division director for this division. Uh, I hope that will give you and your audience an uh, overview of what the agency is about. It's quite a large organization. The central mission is to protect the environment and also support every stakeholders to uh, implement and uh, on these environment laws and regulations for the better environment and for the better uh, uh, services. Yeah. And I think that's everyone, what's everyone talking about? It's safe water. How are we helping our environment to help lower and minimize those uncertainties that are coming our way? And going back to the issue of our aging water infrastru infrastructure systems, what do you think can agencies do to help with the aging water systems and how they're maintained that way they can work properly? And Andrea, I'll go over with you. If I don't know, if, how is Miami ensuring that the aging infrastructure systems are maintained properly? So usually what we do is uh, we maintain an asset management system. So what the asset management system does, it, it'll tell you the age of a certain pipe or a certain motor that we use, and it'll tell you when that should be changed at that point. Um, the other way also is when you are getting funds, uh, so as an example, we do have a, a WIFIA fund. The, what is, is the Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act from EPA. So those are um, low interest loans that we apply to because the, the reality is, you know, to be resilient and to be able to do address some of the infrastructure, you do need the money, you know. And nowadays, uh, one of the things that we're seeing is 20 to 30% increase on most of the construction costs, uh, equipment, chemicals, which is used for treatment. So we need to make sure that we get properly funded to be able to address some of the issues. So in, in our case, as I mentioned, we uh, have been uh, a utility since the 40s, and we are looking right now at investments in, in some of the infrastructure that we have. Most of it at the plant, we did do an upgrade in 2007. And for our flow meters, as an example, we do have what they call um, automated meter readers that were installed back in 
2014 and they're coming in 10 years. So we're doing a, a water loss audit right now with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection to see how much water we're losing and if it's anything in our infrastructure that we need to address. Some of the meters might be good for 20 years, but others we might need to change them. So looking at every item that you have in your overall system from when the raw water comes from out of the wells to the plant, to the distribution, you have to look at everything and make sure you're planning in advance also. Is there gonna be growth in the city that we need to address? Bigger pumps at that point, or are we okay with what we have? So just as a quick example, our plant is for 41 MGD, but most of the daily demand that we have, we don't go above 32. So we know we have enough capacity at this point. We just need to make sure that the pumps are well-maintained and that they are replaced before they fail. And I know we're gonna talk a little bit more about how we're gonna be using the new technology that is coming out. So I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later, how we are using new technology. And you did mention funding, so we are going to be talking about funding later, which is a very important topic. But I'm going to move over into building resilient water infrastructure, because I think infrastructure resiliency is huge right now. With all the uncertainties that are coming in, climate change, you have hurricanes um, over in Miami, you have drought all over the West Coast. So, Jeff, can you, in your opinion, what how would you describe or how would you define infrastructure resiliency? Well, uh, infrastructure resilience uh, is uh, what, what we have been doing a lot of research on that research and development and trying to guide uh, the agency. Uh, the resilience, everybody has a different definition, but overall it is that uh, the infrastructure will provide even in the long term or short term, the required services, regardless of what the impact of the natural disasters or the uh, economic growth, the water demand would be, right? So this is what they call this overall approach. So protect your source water, uh, make the good investment in the drinking water supply and the wastewater treatment, as well as protect the environment. Now, that vision actually is under tremendous threat at this stage because we have two prongs of problems facing the nation. One is climate change. And that basically, as you just in the street, uh, just talked a moment ago, you got the hurricanes and the uh, coastal flooding in the coastal areas, Miami and everywhere else. And also you have a large uh, water stress and the water uh, drought in the West. And there was a water quality changes, such as the uh, algae bloom and the blue algae in the water and the, and the others. So, uh, so in other words, in this confluence over two factors and plus the aging water infrastructure, because what, Aging water infrastructure is a key because it has less capacity to uh, overcome, to, uh, to accommodate these threats. So the uh, combination of that is the key here. And uh, in the ORD, we, about uh, 15 years ago, we produced a large research program. It's called the uh, Nation's Aging Water Infrastructure. And that results of that research goes reported to the Congress and uh, that eventually work with, I mean, the, the uh, America's um, SCE and the other community leaders raised it out and that's why we come with this uh, large infrastructure bill, everybody knows right now and with all the investment. Awesome, thank you. And I think that's something that a lot of people are noticing since our infrastructure, our water infrastructure was built back in the 40s, in the 70s, it wasn't built to withhold all the changes that are happening right now. And Andrea, how is Miami or what can agencies do to design and manage and enhance resiliency against natural disasters? And I know in Miami, you see a lot of natural disasters. So how does Miami manage all of that? 
So uh, we work very closely. We have the Southeast Florida Regional Climate uh, Change that uh, compact that put out a report that gives a little bit of the guidance and what the projections are to 2040 to 2070 on what they're gonna see. Because we do not only have uh, sea level rise, but we do, do have storm surges. So you also have to plan for that. So um, you have to look at what your critical infrastructure is. So most of the time, your, your main infrastructure is going to be that that moves the flow, what moves the water. So you need to make sure that you're addressing electrical. As an example, you have to keep that in mind. You want a, your generators, your substations to be at elevations above that uh, base board or flooding that you have. So you are addressing that. So as an example for us right now, we're trying to do a project with uh, a generator that we have at the water treatment plant. We have two generators because they were built later on. They're inside buildings, they're well protected. The doors that they have are against flooding. And, and the, our, the good thing is our plant, even though we're in North Miami Beach, our plant is a little bit more inland. So that was good planning ahead of time in having the plant a little far away from the coast. Uh, but the, right now we're trying to address another generator that we know we need to do something about it right now. So when we build, we're starting to build things a little bit higher, about 17 feet above ground level. So that way we have that height in case of flooding. So we're trying to address some of, the, uh, of those, like the pumps, our high service pumps are the pumps that push water or in our, as well in our, during sewer, what we're trying to avoid is, like we say, protecting. We try to avoid system sewer overflows. So we need to make sure that our pumps, which are the ones that are moving the liquids, are addressed ahead of time. And especially that we make sure that we do have electricity to be able to continue. Some of our generators also, we're putting solar panels on top of them because we do have enough uh, solar energy here to, to be able to do that. And I think a lot of just pre-planning has to do a lot with collaboration, collaborating with other agencies, collaborating with other sectors. And I'm gonna ask you, Jeff, what can agencies and water agencies and public sectors do to collaborate with EPA to help enhance water resiliency and address water-related risk? Uh, good question, and um, that has been uh, a lot of questions in this conference as well. Today, uh, to EPA as well as to uh, NOAA and to uh, FEMA and uh, to the agencies, what the agencies can do and can collaborate with the water agencies and the local utilities, communities to uh, improve our infrastructure resilience and be able to function at the most difficult time. Uh, with EPA, I think that there are two parts. One is the aging infrastructure. It has been, it has been an issue that, uh, um, that has been uh, the issue for the nation for quite a while. And one of the big, pro, uh, big issue right now uh, that is being addressed by the EPA in collaboration with all the water agencies and the utilities is the uh, lead lines in the drink water distribution system. That is a large uh, chunk of funding through the state revolving funds uh, managed by the Office of Water, EPA's uh, Office of Water. And the way as uh, uh, the research arm of the agency were doing a lot of uh, uh, research on that, on the how to replace these lead lines. And uh, uh, we are selecting um, um, a lot of uh, uh, local districts to demonstrate the, how to identify these data lines, how to detect them, because we many times we don't know uh, the pipes in the ground, right? And the one it was installed. So we don't know where they are. And then we, we are developing methods and we're applying methods to know where they are and trying to uh, find the ways to replace it. So these are the, for the uh, uh, legend uh, for the old infrastructure, aging infrastructure. On the uh, climate side, on the 
official threats. So when you do the master planning, for example, you want to know what is the official threat and design parameters you need to have, right? To to uh, to make the sighting of your treatment plans and uh, and the risk uh, protect the critical infrastructure such as your generators, pumps, as uh, as we just heard from uh, North uh, Miami Beach, right? So so for that we are developing uh, tools and working with other federal agencies. And one of the tools I don't know if you all have heard is called Create. That's called the Climate Resilience Assessment Tool from the OW. And also from my division, uh, uh, I, we have a number of tools uh, that uh, is available to assess the risk and also to find the technical ways, engineering ways, how to do it. And actually, right after this presentation, I'm going to give another presentation precisely about that tool. Well, thank you. And if you're at the conference, definitely go check out that conversation. And Andrea, I'm going to ask you, how are you working with other agencies and how are you collaborating with your partners to help with your program delivery? So thank you for that question. It's important because, as I mentioned, we are in Miami-Dade County. So we do work with uh, Miami-Dade Water and Sewer because they do collect our water and treat our wastewater. So we need to have that communication with them. One of the uh, issues that sometimes we have is when we're trying to push some of our, when it rains really hard, the water table rises here. Some of the people will open manholes and you will get some of the storm water in. So sometimes our pumps cannot push that water into their system. And we do have to communicate all the time because we do have to go to one of their pump stations. We also work with the South Florida Water Management District. Uh, we work with um, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, which is, as uh, Dr. Jeff was mentioning, um, that's the, the, the one that manages most of the legislation here in Florida regarding water and wastewater. We do work with the Department of Health on some of the projects that we need to do. And currently we're working <sighs> the Department of Economic, um, e Economic Development. They are also providing funding right now for low income um, families and, and systems that provide funding for some of these projects as well. So we do have to collaborate. And of course we do work with, you know, with uh, FDOT when they need to do a project, they have to advise us because we need to move sometimes some of our infrastructure. So there is a lot of discussions, a lot of collaboration. The, the one thing that we also do is we do have a, a Florida a team that we talk between the, the water utilities. When there is an issue, like what happened right now with, with uh, the last hurricane, Fort Myers was hit really hard. We would all go into there and we will communicate, do we have people that we can send to be able to assist uh, rebuilding? So we do share those. Um, and we do have meetings during the hurricane seasons also. When we talk to each other and we go and we ask, do you have a, a, a generator, a portable generator or a, a vac truck that we can uh, use for that specific time? So we lend even equipment among each other. Okay. And I'm going to ask another question. What are some successful projects that Miami has worked with or any, uh, any successful projects that you've seen with other agencies that help with the sustainability and res or resiliency of infrastructure? So right now, there is a lot of, of work that is being done towards that. Um, the county right now is working on the protection of Biscayne Bay. So the septic to sewer conversions is something that they're trying to strike very hard. And septic, uh, the septic tanks here, because of the water table, are failing quite a bit. And even though that's not the major contributing uh, factor to the contamination that is in, in the bay right now, everybody's working towards getting some of that funding to be able to convert most of the homes that are close to the coast to actually uh, serve by septic. So there's a lot of funding that is coming out of that. 
And one of the things that we are trying to do specifically here uh, with NMB Water is also assisting the customers to make sure that they are getting connected. Because what's happening is most of the time you will put the main lines for it, but then a person in a home will have to pay $25,000 to be able to abandon their tank and connect. And then that also includes, and people have to be mindful, that that will increase also your water bill because now you have to pay for sewer as well. So it's right now we're just in the in the point that we are finishing one of our projects in Corona del Mar. It's the project that we are just installing that system. And we've collected out of 130 properties, 129 uh, uh, documents that they will allow us for us to install those connections for them. So I think that's a, a pretty good project to talk about. And then Jeff, have you heard anything on EPA side of any successful examples of water resiliency projects or initiatives in any other agencies? Uh, yeah, it's just uh, a lot of, because the way have been work with communities and the, and the work with uh, water agencies. So, uh, so it's a lot of examples of that. Uh, I would like to, to feel, like to believe that uh, all efforts uh, have already led to some good results. And, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, there, there are some. And uh, for example, uh, for myself, I have projects along the entire Atlantic coast uh, from uh, like in Lawrence, Massachusetts, Metapoison, and to Bridgeport, to Chesapeake Bay, to Mobile, Alabama, and, um, and the, all the others, and the water here in Las Vegas. So we have been working with communities. Uh, one of the examples I want to just uh, mention to uh, mention this to everyone in the audience is that uh, uh, when we do factor these, um, these uh, like climate change into the master planning, and then we certainly do say a difference if we consider or not consider. For example, there are uh, wastewater treatment plants in the master planning and the plant uh, at the bridge port, and uh, it's actually quite close to the sea uh, to the seashore, and uh, our uh, storm surge modeling indicated that is going to be submerged. So, uh, one hurricane come to that direction. Uh, the others, for example, um, there are a lot of uh, combined soil overflows communities in the north eastern U U.S. and uh, some of the northwest as well. And uh, in Massachusetts, some of the communities have that problem, and we have been doing the uh, work with them to uh, actively just uh, use use technologies to uh, say what is the what is the uh, how, what is the nature of the storm soil overflow, and during the certain precipitation events, and how the aging water infrastructure should be managed in order to reduce that. And then that's a compliance issue as well. So all of that actually uh, comes to um, to the uh, bio funding as well. And uh, right now there is a, a lot of uh, 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 communities in the process to consider apply for bio funding through the state uh, Revol revolving fund. Uh, and uh, some of the issues that needs to be considered very important element is the climate change impact as well as the uh, EJ issue, the environmental justice. Thank you. And that will guide us into our next topic. And we're kind of halfway through the presentation. So if you have any questions in the audience, feel free to send them your way. We'll be answering questions at the end. But we're talking about funding. It's been a couple of years since the bill has passed and I want they allocated 550 billion to water agencies. And Andrea, how have North Miami seen anything like any improvements from the bill? I know you guys are doing a great job with handling your projects. What are your thoughts on the bill? How has it affected North Miami? So it's very interesting because we haven't been able to um, apply to any of it as of yet. 
We do have some conversations happening uh, next week with some of the representatives. Uh, right now, we do have some FDP funding, but that happened before the bill. Uh, right now, we don't have as much uh, lead replacement. We're still doing the portion of the inventory, and the inventory really doesn't have the funding right now, so we have to do that work before we go and, and do the replacement. Uh, we're looking right now at the PFAS and PFOS, and, and that's the other thing, that, which is some of the forever chemicals that they're talking about. Uh, we didn't have any problems with it before. Now that EPA is changing uh, a little bit of, of the, the, the limits, now we're looking at it. So, uh, you know, we need to see as to where we have to go and what kind of treatment we're going to have to do. I'm kind of glad to hear that some of the uh, changes that might happen is that they're not going to hold the, the water treatment systems um, you know, we're supposed to be now CERCLA, which is a hazard of uh, uh, producers, which really we are not in fault. We should be targeting the sources right now that are coming and affecting our wells. But we're moving through that process. So we're still waiting to see what's going to happen with, with those um, limits when they actually get established. And we will see what of this money we're going to be able to use because we're we're going to need to start planning. And that's what we're doing right now. So we haven't seen any of the funding right now out of the, the fifty five billion dollars. OK, good to know. So we need to work on getting everyone funded so that we can start building more resilient infrastructure. And Jeff. What are EPA research programs that support the infrastructure build projects? And I know you talked a little bit about that before. Uh, yeah, um, uh, glad to talk about that. Um, agency is moving as fast as it, it can, EPA, and both in terms of funding and the research to support such a program. It's, it's a large program. It's not a small dollar amount. So it, it basically, uh, this is a program that will help the nation to uh, have our, uh, to to uh, rebuild our infrastructure for the uh, for the generations to come. So that needs everybody's effort to do that. And uh, regarding the implementation of the funding, that's a part of the program offices. That's not the under the uh, under the authorization for the uh, research and development. Uh, but it's largely is managed by the uh, Office of Water, uh, these uh, program, uh, program offices. But in the, in the ORD, in the research and development in this office, we are actively uh, participating in very large scale research to support the program. One is the lead line uh, replacement I just talked about. And the other is a very large program in my division right now is PFAS. It's PFAS treatment, as well as uh, provide what is the technology we should, uh, uh, which we could use, and what is the cost of, of the different technologies, and provide different options just uh, to manage the PFAS issues. In addition to that, we also have uh, very uh, 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 active programs on the climate change and climate change adaptation. So what is the threat to different parts of the country, for example? In the coastal areas, we have storm surge, have the flooding, and then we have in the Midwest, we have the flooding and the nutrients issues by the climate change. And also in the West, and we have drought, South East, Southwest, right? So these are the different uh, factors we are fact factoring in and produce data and uh, information that's available to the uh, to the uh, uh, water agencies and water utilities. One thing that I'd like to mention to you and to your audience is this. Uh, ORD is act actively looking for collaboration uh, with what are your opportunities? Either in the lead line replacement in the PFAS, as well as in some other large programs I just mentioned. Uh, so um, 
anyone has has uh, intention to say uh, you can just reach to us and uh, and uh, or we'll just uh, would we'll like to collaborate good to know so anyone in the audience they're looking for collaboration and i'm gonna um ask and i'll ask you andre and then i'll also transfer over to jeff but what can we do to ensure that the infrastructure investments that are coming in are equitably distributed, that they're prioritizing underserved communities because we know climate change resiliency is important, but also providing equitable infrastructure and providing clean water for underserved communities is important as well. So, Andrea, how what can we do to provide more equitable infrastructure? Yeah, so that that's a, a very good question. And um, like we mentioned and Corey said, you know, one of the things that I'm looking for is, is affordability. So we can provide water to everybody and that's what we do right now. But you can notice that most um, people after COVID tell you that they lost their jobs or they haven't gone back to work. A lot of people, we in, in Florida specifically, we do have um, uh, older people that are no longer working. They're retired. The cost of, of living just here in Miami has gone up quite a bit. So at least for us, what we are doing is uh, we do have an affordability or a bill assistance program that assists with the customers in paying their bills. So they will apply for it. So in a way, uh, people donate. So people that can pay will donate to assist those other customers that do not have money to pay their water bills. So at the same time, we're making sure that we're staying funded because uh, again, as I said, to be able to provide water to everybody, it needs money. You need to invest the money. So we need to make sure that we're properly funded to be able to do, you have to build your reserves in case of emergencies. And so you have to make sure that whatever you're investing in, you're also receiving. So it's important that uh, people understand uh, the value also of water. A lot of the people, and, and I'm gonna tell a, a, an anecdote. At one point we started doing shut ups of water and we went to this lady's home and the husband called and said, no, she's not here right now. She's at the Hard Rock celebrating a birthday. So it's like, you know, people don't give the value of the water because probably most of the times we, and that's sometimes where the politics come, they don't want to raise rates because they don't want to be voted out, the politicians. But at the same time, it requires money to be able to have good infrastructure. We have to pay consultants, we have to pay contractors, we have to pay our own people. We're losing a lot of people because now um, the, even the labor force right now is telling us like, I, I, I wanna find something else to do because I'm not getting paid enough or I'm gonna go and look at something else to do. So resiliency is also related to the people that we have. We're losing a lot of the people retire mm -hmm. to retirement. I have been able to get some of those folks at least to work with us part time. But, uh, you know, that knowledge you lose as well. So that's also important to know. Yeah. And um, I remember one discussion, it was with transportation where they were talking about gas tax, where the amount that you actually increase is no more than your everyday shampoo or your morning cup of coffee that you're getting every morning. But Jeff, what are your thoughts? How can we make sure that the funds are distributed equi equitably and provide safe water for everyone, especially those underserved communities? Yeah, that, that, that is actually the easy issue. Environment justice has been the central part of this current administration. And it is something that is, uh, embedded in every programs and actions. Uh, and uh, regarding, for example, uh, one issue is a very, uh, is very uh, relevant to the topic we're discussing now. Uh, that is for the climate vulnerability is on, is the, uh, I just got some notice here. Um, 
is is the uh, disadvantaged communities and uh, some uh, poor households they are the least capable of adapting to the change their ability to withhold the impact is much lower so their threshold to breaking down is much is much much lower so in other words they cannot withhold the the impacts so uh, regarding that uh, and particularly if you look at the lead lines, uh, the pipe lead lines, a lot of lead lines is in the old houses, in the old communities, right? And these are the tend to be uh, disadvantaged population. So, so uh, once you apply uh, for grants and uh, to do um, infrastructure, infrastructure renewal projects, uh, need to incorporate these factors into the into the decision making process and that factor is act, actively considered uh, by the EPA in supporting of the infrastructure built projects so, so we're going to go on to our final slide and it's around technology and planning and I think technology plays a huge role especially with utilizing your resources more efficiently right now that, as Andrea mentioned, it's hiring, it's making better use of the money, and it's all really funding. That's how we're going to provide equitable infrastructure. So, Jeff, what can, what role can technology and innovation play to improve water infrastructure, and what have you seen or heard of on your end? Yeah, and there. there uh, I'm a scientist and an engineer, so, so, so. Basically, I, I just, you know, I have a little bit of biased uh, position on that. But that is the fact. If we look back 100 years ago, look at the how the nation has evolved from the uh, sanitation infrastructure to the clean water, clean water supply and safe drink water supply. And it has gone a long way. And in that process, uh, technology is the driven force, right? And then that's why we have wastewater treatment, uh, the uh, sludge process, activity sludge process. We have drink water treatment process. So we have advanced uh, um, uh, membrane system, even just take the uh, salty water and produce drinkable clean water, right? So these are all the technologies that we have developed and, and, and applied. And that has made a lot of difference because during this almost about 100 years, uh, uh, the people's uh, life expectancy has increased dramatically. And largely, if you look at the timing of that increase, uh, that is largely coincided with the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drink Water Act. So that's, that has been demonstrated in science. So, so the technology is important. That's why the ORD, the EPS ORD is developing technologies. And regarding the aging water infrastructure, there are a number of guidelines, tools available right now to evaluate and how to improve it. And uh, regarding the climate change and the climate change adaptation tools that we are developing right now for the wastewater uh, uh, treatment plants for the drink water treatment plants for the urban planning and the, these tools and the science data are all available now in the EPS reports. Okay, and then Andrea, what are your thoughts? How can technology help improve water infrastructure and water infrastructure delivery? So I, I think one of the important things is, you know, the like it says the real time monitoring technologies we now all hear about ai so we're actually getting ready to do a pilot for ai for preventive maintenance to make sure that we have uh, uh, what we need so also similar to to what i uh, mentioned before the lack of personnel that we have at this point. So we need to become more reliable on technology to be able to look at the uh, predictive modeling as to how are our pumps working. 
uh, when you see a decline, okay, you start preparing for it. And at the same time with technology, I think it's it's very important that we are already looking at what everybody's talking about and it's the circular economy of water, which is, you know, you use all of your storm water, but you can also use your wastewater and, and reuse it or, or be able to, to do something more with it. I don't know if we're at, to the point where people are gonna be comfortable drinking their wastewater or converting it 100%. I think it's gonna be a lot of education before we get to that point. But at least we know we can use some of the wastewater for you know, irrigation. Uh, we can use it for reinjection of our aquifers. Or right now at, in Florida, what we're thinking about it is trying to do something so we can fight a little bit of that, that uh, salt water barrier that we can inject in the coast. So we're gonna hope that we're gonna get to one point with technology that we're gonna be able to treat water back to being portable, even if it's wastewater. But I think it will require a lot of education for, for the customers and for everybody to understand. And probably a lot of testing. So that's where I'm gonna rely with uh, Dr. Yang to be able to, to educate and provide us the, the research that we need for better technologies to treat water. Yeah, let me add on that one. And uh, uh, it's, it's just like, like, for example, for the water reuse. Uh, that, that is a huge research program right now, currently at the EPA. And there is a, what is called an indirect reuse and what is direct portable reuse. So there are different ways and uh, largely to address the water availability issues in many parts of the country. And for the ecological uh, uh, reuse and uh, and uh, for something like uh, preventing the salt water intrusion from the coastlines and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And with the AI, so we actually right now we have a program to study and uh, to develop the tools, AI-based tools for the null casting of your treatment system and be able to make the system more resilient at the same time reduce the cost of water treatment in compliance with the Drink Water, Civil Drink Water Act. So there are a lot of things going on and, uh, and uh, certainly technology is going to make, uh, make a large difference. And but application of the technology involves everybody, in, involves everybody even in your audience. Yep, I agree. And like Andrea said, once we get to that point where we have to start reusing wastewater, it's going to lead a lot. We're going to need Jeff to give a whole discussion on education on how to use it. But I'm going to open it up to audience questions and I'll transfer it over to Corey. I don't know if we have any questions for our panelists. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I'm going to start with this question because I think we just saw a little bit of, of real-time collaboration and, and culture building here <laughs> between uh, between the two of you. So um, how do we create a culture around uh, the idea of resiliency? You know, how do we make sure that these discussions happen uh, and continue to happen and become commonplace between cities and, and the EPA? Uh, so, um, Jeff, we, we can start with you on that one. Okay, thanks. Uh, let me give a one, give a shot on that one. And uh, uh, it really requires everybody get involved. And uh, uh, I'm just uh, talking about, for example, for climate change. Uh, uh, in the climate change, uh, basically all of us uh, take the impact from the climate change. But at the same time, if we do resilience, improve the resilience, and be, we, all of us got to involved, be a stakeholder of the programs. Uh, for example, uh, for the uh, water infrastructure, and the, these days a lot of water uh, infrastructure is under capacity, and uh, that's where when people ask it to participate and be safe water, for example, so everyone can be a part of the program. So it's, it's a citizen science, citizen involvement, and the local from the bottom up, that is the way to increase resilience in many ways. And in that, uh, EPA and the other agencies are actively seeking collaboration with uh, communities and they're trying to help out. Andrea, I'll... I'll 
you know, ask the same question to you. So first, I think this is a great way of, of bringing us together. I, I think without this webinar, it would have been very hard for, for Dr. Yang and myself to be in the same conversation. We're in, in completely different places. And I think this is a, a great way of doing it. Uh, you know, the, the water um, in general, most of there's AWWA, as I mentioned, so they do have some collaboration and there are conferences that most of the times we go together and uh, we have the utility uh, management conference as well. So conferences are a good place to have these conversations, but I think it's, it's important that at one point we do start talking a little bit more of what the issues are. And then how can we expect for the government to help? Because politics can be something um, that can also get in the middle of how efficient we can be. So water, water treatment also has to be, uh, you have to hear a little bit more. And I hope that at one point we can have more conversations maybe with our representatives that we can go and we, they can talk up to the federal agencies about what we're seeing. Because sometimes we see things at a, a more a closer level than what maybe EPA gets to see it. Because you see a little bit more, we see the minuscule of what's happening here real time. But it's it's good. I, I probably am going to be talking to Dr. Yang from now on. I'm going to be sending him all of my information and asking him questions. So this is great. It. <laughs> That's great. Well, on that on that note, and, and since you mentioned the conferences, I know that the Dr. Yang has a, a speech to get to here in a minute, and we're coming up on time, and I want to be mindful of that. So I will pass it back over to Stephanie. But thank you both for for coming in and joining us and having this discussion. Yeah. Now, thank you very much to our panelists, and thank you for everything you do. Because, as I said, water it's important, and it's something that doesn't really get a lot of visibility. It's not something that we talk a lot about unless we're at a conference or at a webinar. But I want to thank everyone in our audience and have a great afternoon, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for organizing and, and get us together. And uh, thank you. <laughs>